The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to go over some summer garden problems as well as August to-do list. Our guest will be Kelly Orzel, author, and will answer your garden questions. The hour is jam-packed, so let's start right now. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being part of the program today and allowing us to be part of your hour. I am your host, Joy Barrett. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Barrett. This program is about you, for you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. If you are, we, we, whether you're listening to us on one of the 15 AM and FM frequencies that are broadcasting our program here in 2021 in the United States, podcast replay, in-studio video replay, a radio app through our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, Season 5 tab at the top of the page. However, you're consuming the content. We thank you. There's a number of ways to, to be exact, on how you can get a hold of us. If you'd like to talk with us, you can do that by emailing us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, gardentalkradio at gmail.com, or if you'd like to talk to us, you can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW, S-H-O-W. That's 1-800-927-7469, toll-free, coast-to-coast. Big show lined up for you, so let's get into it, Holly. Problems that we are facing in our garden and summer problems that people are facing in general. Sure, sure. So one thing is that sometimes people's beans, especially their uh, bush beans, look kind of wilty. Pole beans will do the same thing. Right. So, and it, like their leaves kind of curl, they just kind of look, I don't know, like almost dehydrated, but not like... Almost like a chemical burn. Yeah, like a chemical Or burn. a chemical drift. There you go. And it's not a chemical drift, and it's not that your plants are dehydrated, it's because of actually too much water. What? Yeah. So, is that a thing? I guess in some areas it might be, some areas it might not be. And it happened to us, we had, uh, I don't know, like a week of a lot of rain, and then our beans looked a little wilty, we looked into it, and it's just because of a little bit too much water. When the weather changes, they dry out a little bit, and then you're you're better. Beans, <clears throat> beans can love beans love the heat. Uh, the more heat you can give it, the better you can. The better they'll grow. Uh, kind of the same thing as eggplant. As long as you keep the soil moist around the root system, uh, put the heat to them, they love it. Uh, soybeans in the agricultural world are the same way, uh, but our beans have too much water, and uh, we thought, you know, we knew it wasn't a chemical drift. So then we had to start investigating why do they look the way they do too much water so we uh cut the irrigation system on them for a couple of days um they do come back and they'll be okay they may still have some remnants of the curly leaves issue but other than that it'll be fine another one that we are seeing uh multiple times on social media right now and maybe you've posted a picture of your tomatoes uh, the fruit being blackened on the bottom Right, so when the fruit is blackened on the bottom, that is blossom and rot. Um, it's not a disease, it's not a pest, it's ex- actually a physiological problem with your tomatoes. And so there's good and bad things that live in your soil, in everybody's soil, not just your soil, and, and everybody's. And um, there's also a lot of nutrients in your soil, including calcium. And so if you have a, it's not necessarily... A lack of calcium, you might think, well, I just had my soil tested and it's fine and, you know, I have all the good nutrients. It's not that. It's a lack of access to your plants um, getting that calcium. Uh, powdered milk, Tums, liquid milk. People will put these in the hole at the time of planting. Um, they will say, well, just add, just dissolve two Tums in a gallon of water and water it in and that'll fix the problem. Epsom salt, put Epsom salt. First of all, Eighth grade science <clears throat> teaches us that Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate, and calcium is calcium. 
So those two don't go together that you put magnesium to fix the calcium deficiency. The reason why it works... The reason why it works is because you're watering your plants. And not because... The, it, I mean, obviously well, the plant's uptaking magnesium, but it's not substituting the magnesium for the calcium right. deficiency. So when you're going to add the, the gallon of water that had Tums dissolved or whatever... You're adding water, essentially. And you're, wa what you're watering the plants. <laughs> watering the plants. So what happens is then that calcium is free to release itself into the plant. It's not locked up. Then the problem goes away. And you're like, oh, it was the Tums or it was the Epsom salt or it was the powdered milk, whatever. It, if you do this, if you water in consistent water, it doesn't fix the problem that's on the plant as it speaks. Um, it may, you know, you're going to have the blackness of the bottom of the fruit. Take those off immediately as soon as you see them, even when the plants are green, uh, because that's going to allow the plant to focus energy on other fruit development. This should greatly help the next set of fruiting uh, on the plant. And this is 90, probably 96.9% of the time, this is the problem, the inconsistency of water. There's that 4.1% where there is other things that can alter the rottingness of the bottom of the fruit. But the majority of the time, it is the lack of available calcium being uptaken from the plant. Right. So that's the blossom end, right? Um, another problem that people have in their garden, especially it seems to be this time of year, is slugs. And slugs are, they will eat your Everything. leaves. Yeah, they're, just, they're the little goats of the garden. They kind of are, yeah. And so what we've discovered is that they like beer. And not, <laughs> you're not out there cracking a beer with the slugs. Um, what you do is you take a, a, a cup or a, a small dish, a tuna can, whatever, and you bury it so it's it's level with the soil. And then you put beer in it, and the be the slugs are attracted to it. Then they fall in, and then they drown and die happy because they're drunk. Just like any other application in which to remove a problem, don't put that beer in the cup or the tuna can underneath the plant that the problem is persisting move it far enough away to where you can lure these uh, in, the, the, in this instance the slugs away from the plants that they are trying to eat uh, put it two or three or four foot away that aroma will attract them but just don't put it right under the problem because then everybody comes to have the feast and some of them may make it in the beer and die and others may find themselves consuming the plant that you're trying to protect Okay, so another problem is powdery mildew, and this is typically on things like the, the vining plants that have the big leaves. So I, I've got a list. You've got a list. Uh, grapes, beans, cucumbers, uh, watermelon, pumpkin, uh, cantaloupe. Squash. Squash. That, that gets most of them there. Yeah, I would say. So you go out to your garden, and it has like it looks like somebody kind of sprinkled baby powder yes. on your plants, essentially. And that's how you know you have it. Disclaimer, there are some varieties of squash that have the appearance that they have powdery mildew, but that is just the leaf structure and the color pigmentation that those leaves present. Right. But you'll know you have it if you go up to it, you can rub your thumb on right. it. Right. And the powder will kind of come off on your thumb or your finger, whatever. So, <clears throat> yeah, powdery mildew, that is something that you can get, and it's caused by... Um, Warmer nights with higher humidity, and then warmer days with higher humidity. It doesn't allow the leaves to dry off. Uh, there are ways in which you can break up that mildew and allow the sun to penetrate. Otherwise, in most instances, the mildew will suffocate the plant and won't allow any photosynthesis to occur, and then you've got a dead plant. Right. So you can do a few things where you spray it on the leaves to help break it up. Or if you only have it on like one plant or a portion of a plant, you can remove up to 25% of the foliage, foliage, and then you can remove those leaves, but it, it might continue to spread. So what you can do is you can take things like milk and you dilute it with water. It's, I think it's a, two, a three, three to one ratio. So one part milk, three parts water. And then you can use vinegar, like apple cider vinegar. Some people use baking soda. Um, some people just use water. They, they really douse it down with water so you fight 
water with water, essentially. So there's a few different options for you. If you are removing a one plant or several leaves of a plant that is infected, be very cautious of how you take that out of your garden because these are spores that will attach themselves to your hands, to your gloves, as you're carrying that plant over other plants of like variety. Those spores can fall on those plants and start infecting them. And you don't know about it until, you know, for a week or so later. And then all of a sudden you've got another plant right beside the one you got rid of that's got the problem that you actually infected that plant because of transmitting it over the top of it. Right. So that's the powdery mildew. And then we also have Japanese beetles. We've talked about this a few times. The traps work well. If you don't have a lot of them, you can always just pick them off and, and destroy them. I know some people do that. If you live in an area that maybe you do have a lot, you would want to get the traps. And you can get the traps from Rescue, which is rescue.com. And you don't want to put it, so if you have, you know, Japanese beetles on your beans, you don't want to put it right next to your beans. You want to put it about 30 feet away, if possible, on the opposite side of the yard. Um, also, Phylum Bioproducts, uh, Beetle Gone has a product that you can spray that's non-toxic um, to butterflies, insects, and bees, and um, zero toxicity to water, and that will work as well. But, yeah, the application for the, the trap, every, you know, People will say, oh, it brings more insects in. Well, you it, you have to utilize the trap and do it the way it's supposed to be instructed instead of just throwing it in the garden and going, oh, it's good enough because it's in the garden. Uh, the, there's always going to be that debate. Oh, it brings more beetles in than what it If you do it right, you're going to see a, a significant improvement uh, on the plants. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, weeding. We've always got weeding. We've always got weeds. Uh, we transitioned, for many of you who follow the program, uh, we've transitioned from traditional ground to majority raised bed. Uh, we did the final transition this spring, and we still have weeds. That doesn't mean that you have zero weeds when you go to raised beds. What it means is you can greatly um, uh, improve the management of the removal of weeds because you have specific areas that you are controlling the weeds in. The raised beds, the four by eights, the four by twelves, the four by sixteen raised beds, rather than a three foot wide by twenty foot long swath of ground that everything in in the world is growing in, creeping Charlie, uh, thistles, all of these other uh, weeds that you continue to fight, and it seems to be a losing battle, and that's why we transitioned to that investment of the raised beds uh, over the course of the last two years. Right, and you know. I think it's personally easier to pull weeds in a raised bed than out of the ground. And because I feel like you've got the good you, loose soil. Yeah, you've got the good loose soil. And it's it's a little bit more enjoyable also because I think you just kind of can mentally break it up. And it doesn't seem so overwhelming to me. And, and we would weed those 10 foot wide by 3 foot or 10 foot wide by 10, uh, 3 foot wide by 10 foot long uh, designated grow areas in the ground. Uh, in the spring, and within a month, we could not even tell we did anything, and we removed roots and roots and roots and roots, and it was it a was losing. It, it was, was losing battle. No, it was not fun, and it was very time consuming and strenuous. Well, what is not time consuming or strenuous is Walton's Incorporated. Whether you are a hunter fisher uh, person, um, a rancher, or you need good seasoning and spices in order to cook, Walton's has everything that you need, but the meat. Exactly, and we're, we're heading into that, that season where there's a lot of uh, meat harvesting. So we know you care about where your food comes from. At Walton's, you can get all the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage jerky and any other meat product your way to your high standards. Do you want to make snack sticks that people will actually like? I Walton's, do. Yeah, Walton's creates meat, created meatgistics.com. It's an informational website to help educate people on the hows and whys of meat processing, as well as a community of almost 15 thousand users who will help give their opinion and guidance on meat processing issues you can find that at meatjustics.com if you want everything else whether it be the stuffer mixer meat grinder seasoning all sorts of good stuff you can go to waltonsinc.com again that's waltonsinc.com well when we come back hang around we've got an august to-do list that uh, will we'll help you through the month of august in your garden you're listening to the garden with joy and holly radio show a program to help your garden grow better 
got a question for Joey and Holly, send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We here at the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show Gardens understand that healthy soil is the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the microbes needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jims will stimulate life into your soil, supplying all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% biodegradable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. The nutrients are readily available to maximize their genetic potential. Chicken Soup for the Soil will increase the quality of the fruit and vegetables you grow. Visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night, dries clear, and odorless. It will not clog your sprayer. Deer Defeat works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Safe, effective, and works on rabbits. Money-back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use code RADIO to save 10% on your order. Deer Defeat. It can't be beat. Rinse Kit, your hose on the go. Pressurized water at your fingertips. Without pumping or batteries, simply fill from your spigot or sink on your way out to the garden, beach, or anywhere. Spray it, wash it, rinse kit. Now that your garden is in place, help your plants grow with Chapin's sprayers. Use our hose in and handheld sprayers to feed your plants and control pests. Set up a fertilizer injector to water and feed at the same time. Cover large areas with a backpack or ATV sprayer. Chapin equipment is available at all major home improvement and hardware stores and online at www.chapinmfg.com. Chapin, cover more ground. Are you frustrated by how hard and dry your soil gets at this time of the year? You're not alone. The problem is that your soil has a high clay content. The clay shrinks and hardens as it dries, squeezing the air out of the soil. When soils are tight, roots are under stress and can no longer absorb water and nutrients easily. If you want to start improving your compacted clay soil, give Aerify Plus a try. For 20 years, homeowners and landscapers have been using liquid Aerify Plus to aerate and bioactivate their soils. Aerify Plus contains a soil penetrant as well as a liquid humates and seaweed. Visit our friends at natureslawn.com to find out more about this amazing Aerify Plus product. That's natureslawn.com. Cousinscompost.com offers a full range of compost and vermicomposting supplies, including the new Royal All Natural Worm Bedding. Shop Cousins Compost for composting worms, worm castings, indoor and outdoor worm bins, and compost bins. Use coupon code REDWORM21 for 10% off your order at CousinsCompost.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger, Dripworks, Waltons Incorporated, Tree Diaper, Janie's Mill, Phylum Bioproducts, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Nature's Lawn and Garden Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Dr. Jim's, Root Maker. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Glad that you allow us to be part of your day-to-day and that you will be part of ours. Well, speaking of uh, weather not being cooperative, many parts of the country are dealing with a severe drought. The west, the southeast, uh, everywhere has got some level of drought. Tree diaper can help all of our gardens grow a little bit better with the tree diaper. Before tree diaper, watering tree shrubs and bushes was not your favorite job on your property, but with tree diaper, it's not really a job. Tree diaper is a revolutionary watering system that slowly restores, releases stored rainwater when plants need it. The tree diaper is filled with water from rain or when you water and slowly releases water over three weeks. No pipes, hoses, or electricity needed. Whether you're a first-time gardener or advanced, tree diaper will help you improve the way you water your plants. 
Every time it rains, Tree Diaper recharges. It's made in the USA. You can check out all the sizes they have available at TreeDiaper.com. That's TreeDiaper.com. Well, August is nearing uh, the calendar, so there is some things in which we can do in the month of August in our garden. Now, mo- there are there are a certain degree of or certain caliber or group of gardeners that think that gardening starts Memorial Day weekend in many portions of the northern parts of the United States. And Labor Day, it's over. It's done. We're going home. We'll see you next spring. Uh, however, there is a lot of opportunity before lay, before Memorial Day and after Labor Day for the garden. And we're going to talk about some of the things in order to prepare here. But first, we talked about it in segment one. We're going to talk about it again in segment two is weeding. There's always weeding to be done. And you may think, well, at this point, why does it matter? Well, it matters because if you don't weed and you let those weeds go, what happens to those weeds? Those weeds seed. There you go. And then now instead of one thistle or one piece of fescue, you've got a whole field right? Uh, that's graciously growing in your backyard uh, that you could have slowed down that p- possibility of having that mess. Right. So that is definitely something you want to make sure you are on top of. You e- may- even if you don't want to pull the weeds, just hack them so they don't produce seed. When you see that seed pod, you know, if you really want to just, you know, I don't want to just go out there with the, the shears like Brutus the Barber Beefcake had. WWF way back. You know, I'm talking. You have no idea who I'm talking about. No. There's people that they're nodding their head. Well, that's go, yeah. Fine. And just okay. go and just knock those seed knock pods. Knock them down yeah, like Brutus. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. OK. So you also want to harvest. You want to harvest. Obviously, but you want to harvest frequently right. and thoroughly. If you don't, if you don't, you're going to get uh, massive vegetables, and you might think, "Well, I, you know, what's wrong with having the largest zucchini or the longest beans?" Or you whatever. can't eat them. You can't eat them. They become oftentimes chewy. They become not very edible woody um kind of some some stuff turns kind of stringy well when the beans get real long the pot the the actual seed inside of it matures and it becomes very difficult to eat in addition the plant shuts down its job is to produce seed for the next generation it doesn't care that you're picking to can or freeze right and then the zucchini we did find there is an alternative if you do and most of us will walk into the garden and find a 15 pound zucchini that we didn't know existed that's when you drop it off on your neighbor's doorstep well you could do that or you can make <laughs> zucchini relish out of it yes you can make zucchini relish. And, and it's a great great thing to do with those very very large i think it's better than cucumber relish i think it's delicious too you don't even have to have it on anything you just eat it right um so anyway yeah okay so you want to harvest frequently and thoroughly um you want to continually harvest you want to make sure you know tomatoes if you go to your garden and you think the tomato looks ready, but, oh, I'll just wait one more day, just harvest it then, it's better to do it now. And then before you, then you, you wait the next day and then you forget and then it's next week. and Or to- somebody picks it or yeah. something gets it. The pigmentation of a tomato ripens. It ripens from the bottom up. So you just if you see the base of the tomato beginning to change on your tomatoes that do change to a red, green, or a red, yellow, orange, purple color... Uh, go ahead and harvest it a couple of days early. It, and then here's the other thing. If you've got a, I think it's called a grandma sausage and a green zebra, those don't change color. Or there's a big beefsteak that is a green variety. So you kind of got to know what you planted so you're not waiting for that green tomato to change when it's never going to change because it's not right. going to. <laughs> right. So you want to keep that in mind. But I think the point is, is that you might think, okay, if I let this go, I'll remember it or whatever, and that might not always be the case. So just make sure you're. This you're is why you're. This is why you're growing a garden for the frequently available, low cost items that you can, can you know, harvest, bring in, and eat or preserve. Right. Um, so you also want to on that on that note, you want to think about what did well. So maybe you grew okra for the first time, and you're like, eh, I don't know if I got the reward I wanted. I don't even like okra. Um, or so, cauliflower bro- right. uh, cauliflower or uh, broccoli. Yeah. So you want to think about that. And then th- and then also, you know, note that maybe maybe you, you planted it wrong or some who knows, whatever. Or maybe you're just like, I don't think this is going to grow. Note that for next year. Right. And then also note what did well. Or here's the other thing. Note the things, you know, if you've started stuff from seed... Versus what you got from the garden center. What did better? 
Why did the garden center stuff do better? Was my seedlings or my starts too small? Were the seeds that I was growing or starting them with too old and didn't have a good germination rate? It is important to invest in good quality products or materials or plants if you want to do this the right way. Just like golfers or car collectors or um, trap shooters, they don't buy the El Cheapo stuff and then expect things to really be great and they win rewards and they're able to hit exactly what they're shooting at. They invest in good quality piece of, uh, pieces of equipment and do things right the first time. Right. And also, like you had said, you know, maybe... Maybe something didn't grow well, but maybe something grew really well. You know, that's good to keep in mind as well. So, with that being said, uh, maybe you want to think about fall planting yeah. at this point. Uh, what it, it all depends on where you're at and how long things need to be in the ground prior to your average first frost of the fall. Things like lettuce or, or things like radishes, for example, take 30 days to reach maturity. So, you and they don't like heat very much. So you would want to plant those farther into the fall months before a freeze would come upon you. Uh, for example, we grow in Zone 5 turnips and rutabagas. They get planted the first week in August. Rutabagas take 90 days to reach maturity. Turnips take 60 days to reach maturity. So they are kind of done in that first week. Uh, we usually harvest whatever we have available that first week in November because we get that typically we get a, a snow or a hard freeze at that point right and we'll talk about in a couple of weeks growing great garlic but start looking for garlic uh that's a, a crop that you should be putting in the ground so if you are if you are going to do fall planting you can kind of transition that into thinking about winter planting maybe you've heard one of our guests talk about um uh, cold frames or uh, low tunnels or poly tunnels, whatever, and you want to think about that, you might want, this might be the time for you to do a little research and planning for winter planting, winter growing. Yeah, anything you plant in the spring, you can plant in the fall. You just got to be, you know, do your research. There's some things that's going to do better uh, versus and all that, you know, your peas, your radishes, lettuce, spinach, turnips, rutabagas, uh, kale, cabbage, you know, all that stuff. So keep that in mind. Uh, divide your perennial flowers. Now is the time getting to that point where you can divide them. And uh, make sure that if you're going to divide a perennial flower, that that flower can be divided because there are some that if you divide them, you kill them. There's some that you can hack the heck out of and they just they laugh at you and just keep growing. There's other ones that you look at it wrong and it, it's done. I have a lot of friends, um, acquaintances, what have you, on social media who bought your first house this year and you have questions about like what do I do with all these hostas or all these bleeding hearts or tiger lilies or whatever you have. This is the time where you're going to divide those, maybe pass them on to somebody. Oh, your mom hates the daylilies. <laughs> you're, you're, it's, the more she digs, the more the roots there yeah. are. They, they just, they're in, kind of to the level of invasiveness. They're a little bit invasive. Uh, she she oh, just digs and throws them, just not happy with them. And that's the other thing is if you bought your first house and you're like, okay, I've gone from maybe doing a couple containers, I want to transform my backyard, whatever. This is the time to think about it. You have you have the full foliage, so you can determine where the sun's going to be, and you can plan where you're going to put your vegetables next year. Look up. Yep. Uh, fertilize. It still is important to fertilize. Uh, your you know there's certain plants that do like a fuller feed or a liquid feed or a granular feed around the base. Um, we're in almost August, uh, so you can still add um, fertilizer around your tomatoes. Give them a little boost, whether it's liquid, whether that's a compost tea, whether that's a, a manure tea. Um, you know, follow the instructions or do research so you're not over feeding them. Uh, but that's going to help give a little more umped, a little more energy boost to these plants before, you know, to get another month in, another two months, 60 days, 65 days, uh, because there's a lot of growing time still left on these plants. Right. So, yeah, you can definitely think about fertilizing. Um, and then... What else do we have? Well, there's many things in which uh, you can be doing now. But I guess the biggest thing is know what did good, know what didn't do good, and enjoy. Just sit out in the garden and look and enjoy the time, whether it's a big garden, a couple of containers, or the whole backyard. Take a little time and enjoy what you've got. 
especially if you have bird feeders, it's really peaceful to sit out there, watch the birds, and um, like like Joy said, just enjoy it. And even if you're just going to, maybe even an irrigation system, but now that the, the evenings are pretty decent, maybe you go out there and you do your hand watering. Right. Yeah. So uh, summer's in full swing, as we're all very aware of it, and uh, we are seeing in our neck of the woods, and I'm sure you are as well, the Japanese beetles, and they are not coming in just to say hi. They're wreaking havoc, havoc on our gardens. If you're looking to successfully control beetles without damaging the environment, look no further than Beetle Gone from Phylum Bioproducts. Derived from a naturally occurring soil bacteria, Beetle Gone is the only organic solution that successfully controls beetle invaders. Just mix the powder with water and spray it on your plants. Once ingested, the targeted pest will stop feeding and die. And since it's an organic BT product, you know it's a great choice to use on your fruits and veggies in addition to your ornamental flowers and trees. Not only is Beetle Gone works not only does it work well but the best part about it it is safe to use around beneficial insects like butterflies bees and ladybugs and has zero that zero 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 water toxicity that's beetle gone from phylum bioproducts that's p-h-y l-l-o-m bioproducts.com well hang around don't go anywhere author kelly orzel will be with us you're listening to the garden with join holly radio show a program to help your garden grow better have a garden question give joey and holly a call now or anytime 24 7 just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Straight from the farm, fields, and briar patch, Piper and Leaf Artisan Tea is a tea like you've never imagined it. Get our award-winning tea delivered right to your front door and become part of the Piper and Leaf family. Free shipping over $75 at PiperAndLeaf.com. The Water Hoop is a portable water sprinkler system that allows you to target water evenly around the root ball of your tree or bush, conforms to various shapes for your watering needs. The Water Hoop reduces runoff and saves money. Visit waterhoop.com. Soul Brew Kombucha is founded and handcrafted in Milwaukee, 100% organic, formulated for ultimate health and enjoyment. Find out the benefits of drinking kombucha and where to purchase at mysoulbrew.com or find them on Facebook at mysoulbrew. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code RADIO21 and get 15% off your entire order. ShipDrop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, ShipDrop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ShipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Simply Earth, Seed Savers Exchange, Quick Snap Sprinklers, Water Hoop, Timber Pro Coatings, Bloomin' Easy Plants, Pomona Universal Pectin, Ivy Organics, Tiger Torch, Happy Leaf LED, Seed Link. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Moments away, Kelly Orzel. But first, you got Japanese beetles flying around your yard. Rescue has a trap that will help prevent the damage to your plants. Japanese beetle traps, when used properly, draw beetles away from your plants and trees. The trick is to hang them 30 feet from plants you want to protect. That way you lure beetles away from the areas where they cause damage and trap them. Rescue Japanese beetle traps are the only traps with a controlled release lure that 
last the entire beetle season. Their extra large bags is welded directly to the trap, stays put even when it's full of beetles. And the Rescue Japanese Beetle Trap is the only trap with a reusable bag that opens and closes at the bottom. If beetle season is a bad one, you just open, empty the bag, and keep trapping the beetles with the same trap. You can find all this information at rescue.com. And their products are made in the USA. That's rescue.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Kelly Orzel is a small scale herb farmer, author, speaker, and grows in coastal Maine. Her book is The Backyard Gardener. Welcome to the program, Kelly. Hi, thank you. Well, we want to thank you for taking time out of your day, not only to in, enlighten Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. And I'll start with this. You love mulch just about as much as we love mulch. What is your favorite mulch? And then also, what mulch should vegetable gardeners be avoiding? Oh, I do. I do love me some mulch. Um, my number one go-to organic mulch is seaweed. Um, I'm very lucky. I live on the coast, so I can go and get some. And one of the best things is it's free. <laughs> it does everything a good mulch should do. It suppresses weeds, keeps the roots cool, um, uh, builds up the soil structure and all that, but it does some other things. It has additional um, plant growth hormones and regulators. It has small amounts of uh, readily available minerals and nutrition um, that plants necessarily need. It stimulates uh, soil life, bacteria, and microbes that live in our soil, and um, it's just, it also has an added benefit. <laughs> it repels um, uh, slugs and snails, because when they take their little squishy bodies and they rub themselves along the crink crinkly, salty uh, seaweed, it will actually burn them, so it will keep, keep them off your plants, which I think is a great bonus. <laughs> well, with, so. with that being said, number one, you said it was free, so it's not one of these things that it works great, but i got to go get it in the cover of night. And yeah, Well, it's... Yeah, you don't have to, it, as long as it's not in the water, okay. it's not considered living, it's not considered part of the ocean ecosystem. So um, it, as long as it's dry and up on the sand, you can go and get as much as you want. I go with my little pitchfork and, uh, you know, rubber-made tubs <laughs> and, and stock up. But if you don't have seaweed, I love straw for an organic mulch as well. I use a lot of that, like if there's just not as, a, as much seaweed available. Um, and for inorganic, it's I love using landscape fabric. Um, it's a uh, woven polypropylene, um, sunbelt landscape fabric, and I use that on my farm a lot, especially for um, scaling crops up when I, have a, when I need to cover a lot of space. Yeah, we've got a lot of listeners up, uh, up in the Boston area on WCRN 8.30 a.m. And uh, when you apply the, the seaweed, are we grinding up? Are we just laying it on the ground? And secondly, do you need to be concerned with the salt affecting the soil? No, I used to be concerned about the salt um, in the soil. And then um, at the Coastal Lane Botanical Garden, they had um, this guy, uh, I forget his first name, but his last name is McNichols. And he was like their mulch guru. And we had a whole big talk. And he said, don't, don't worry about it. The first time I was nervous, but after I did it one year, it was no problem. You just take the, um, the seaweed as is. You can pull it apart so that way it kind of molds, you know, to the, to the shape of the bed and the, the height that you need. And you just lay it down there. And you, I put it over my irrigation obviously. Um, and then, you know, the rainwater, whatever salt goes in, it's, it's so minuscule, it's not going to affect it. The only thing I do do is if I'm going to take the mulch off at the end of the season and, and put it in the compost bin, I will rinse it off because I don't want the salt um, uh, affecting the compost and the microbial activity. But other than that, just put it on and let it um, de decompose and all that good stuff that's in the seaweed, all that marine life and all those minerals um, will actually go into your soil. So it's another, I like it because it also builds your soil naturally. That's very interesting. We we live right by uh, Lake Michigan, and now you got me thinking about some of that vegetation <laughs> that, that comes back up onto the, uh, the shore. Um, so as an herb farmer, what are your best tips for those who... Um, have issues growing herbs, especially rosemary and lavender. How can people stay motivated? Uh, well, first, I think the first thing you got to do is make sure you uh, select the right variety for your climate. As a cold climate gardener, growing Mediterranean herbs can be a bit of a challenge. <laughs> Um, so you want to pick cold, start with um, making sure you pick cold tolerant varieties and also varieties that um, will work for you. And you want to be realistic about your expectations. So like rosemary is just not going to overwinter in zone three no matter how much mulch you, you put around it. But um, you can bring it in to overwinter it. But if you pick, put 
yeah, sorry, if you choose cold tolerant varieties and you use some season extension, I've been able to grow fresh lavender, uh, fresh rosemary and lavender up through Christmas, which is great for all those Christmas turkeys and having that fresh aroma. Um, for rosemary, some of my favorite cold tolerant varieties are Garizia, has these huge leaves, incredibly high oil content. Tuscan Blue is another really flavorful one. Our, uh, Blue, Spy, uh, Blue Spire and Spice Island. Um, it's just great. And also with rosemary and lavender, when you harvest, you want to make sure you never cut into the old wood because um, it will not regrow from there. So when you're harvesting, you also, and for throughout the season, you always want to make sure that you're only cutting into the green because then it's always going to reshoot from those locations. And with lavender, the first thing you want to do in its first year is never let it bloom. If you see flowers, cut them off immediately because you want to um, let all that energy go back into plant establishment. And another big thing with lavender is especially in cold climates, it will require some um, overwintering, but it will, it has a really good perennial life if you, I use like straw and I mulch around it, around, and then I cover it with a row cover and use either T-posts or like big rocks to weight it down. And what that does is it really prevents the uh, cold winter winds from drying out the rosemary, uh, I'm sorry, the lavender. Everyone, for some reason, always thinks that it's the water and the the wet and the cold snow that kills the lavender. It's really the the drying winds that do that. So by by insulating it with some mulch and covering it with the row cover, it's going to eliminate that. And again, um, variety is so important for like um, culinary in like the cold areas. I would suggest um, Hyde Coat, Munstead. Jean Davis is a beautiful pale pink. Pink. Um, those are all English, um, hardy. They're usually smaller. They're about 18 um, to uh, 24 inches, so they're smaller, but those are the culinary ones and really hardy. Um, the other type of lavender, which is, this is like the lavender you think of when you go to, like, France, is like those big, fluffy, um, you know, clouds of purple is the lavendins. And it's essentially it's a um, hybrid between the English and the French. And they're larger in shape. They have much stronger scents. And so if you're looking for lavender for craft projects or essential oils or making hydrosols, they're going to be your better bet. And my favorite varieties for them, um, cold-wise, so they're, they're really tolerant, is Provence, um, Grosso, and then Grosso Alba, which is a white. And they all get about three feet with a piece. So they're just these huge incredible plants, but they just, that winter protection and, you know, avoiding that bloom um, in that first year are the key. And this, remember, do not cut into the old wood, otherwise it's going to, you're going to be surprised that there's no more plant left. Right, and whenever you overwinter and you're using that row cover, you're preventing the row cover from compacting on top of the plant, correct? Or you're trying to keep it upright, or is it okay to get a little compaction? It's okay to get a little compaction. It's it's more so um, the row cover I find is more so to keep the uh, the straw in place because without that, um, you know, unless you have a immediate snow, the the mulch can can be uh, blown away. So it does a little bit of insulation, but it's really there mostly to kind of keep everything contained and kind of create this little nest around the lavender. Great. Thank, thank you. So we are talking with Kelly Orzel. She's a small-scale herb farmer and also an author of The Backyard Garden. So your book, The Backyard Gardener, um, please tell us more about it and maybe an interesting tip or something to encourage our listeners to check it out. Sure. Um, I wrote it as like a holistic approach to the vegetable garden because that's how I grow. I, I grow everything organically and I have a whole chapter just on organic techniques that I use on my farm that I also use in my personal gardens. Um, and I have a lot of information about season extension. And that's one of the biggest things I tell people is that, you know, if you can just combine two or more techniques, it's like moving your whole garden to zone south. So that increases your growing time for four to six weeks on either end. And when I say combining two techniques, an example of that would be using row covers in a hoop house. So that's two different types, and you're going to get extend, get that season extension on either end of the season. You could also use raised beds inside a hoop house or raised beds with row covers or a cold frame with row covers. Um, all of those things will just kind of greatly increase your um, 
your production season, which I think is just huge. And also there's, in the back of the book, I do a monthly garden chore chart um, for new gardeners because I found that when I first started gardening, it was so hard to know, when do I do this? When should I be doing this? So it's just kind of a little helpful tip to help people um, get started. Now, you encourage everyone to grow comfrey. Why, <laughs> yes. why, why grow comfrey? Because I know this kind of a comfrey is kind of a thing in the UK and the allotments, but why, what's your uh, example? Why, why do we want to do this? Sure. I, I, think, I don't understand why in America comfrey gets such a bad rap. I think comfrey is amazing. I was gifted some probably about eight years ago, and it was like the biggest eye opening. Um, uh, gift I ever got. So the only thing I will say, I got what's called true comfrey, and that does grow legs and will spread easily. So if you <laughs> let that go to flower, <laughs> you will get more. <laughs> um, so I always suggest for people who are starting out to grow the Russian comfrey, which is a sterile variety, so it won't set seed and, and grow legs on you. Um, if you're looking for it, look for the Bocking 14 cultivar, B-O-C-K-I-N-G, and the number 14. Um, and what I love about comfrey, it's full of nitrogen, potassium, and um, phosphorus, but it's really just chock full. It has a good um, amount of nitrogen, but it's really high in potassium, and it has these deep roots that goes deep through your soil and pulls all that nutrients to the surface, and it's stored in their leaves. So what you can do is, my favorite thing is, I chop that thing to the ground multiple times a season, and I chop everything up, and I make comfrey tea, which is super simple. You just put, like, a big, um, like, a five-gallon bucket from, like, you know, one of the big box stores. I fill it with the chopped comfrey leaves and stems, and then I fill it with water, use a, like, a brick to weight it down and cover it up and leave it in the sun for about three weeks. And it will smell pretty rank when you open it up, but it is just chock full of nutrient goodness for any kind of flowering plant. So particularly vegetables that will flower in fruit, like your tomatoes, your cucumbers, your squashes, your peppers, all that kind of good stuff. So whenever I see um, those plants starting to flower, I will... Um, I will pour um, a dilute. I usually use a 10%, 10% of the tea with uh, 90% water. Some people do it directly on, and I've tried it, and it, it doesn't hurt the plant. <laughs> but um, I always just tend to, I want to make it go as far as I can. So I make the comfrey tea, um, and it just, it really helps with disease resistance, overall plant health, but it really helps with fruit and flower production. So that's one way I use it. I also use it as a compost accelerator, so it, it activates the soil microbes. So again, I chop it up, and then I layer it within my compost pile, and it just kind of helps speed up and kind of encourage all that microbial activity, which creates all that delicious good <laughs> organic matter. And thirdly, you can also use it as a nutrient-rich mulch. I think of it as like chop and drop. So you chop up the leaves, uh, flowers, and stems. Again, only flowers if you are using the sterile Russian comfrey. <laughs> do not do that if you're using the, the old, um, the old true, um, you know, true comfrey. But, and then I just actually, I pull the mulch away from my plants and I drop the, um, the chopped up comfrey. And then I'll, put the, um, what is it called, the, the mulch back uh, against the plants. And what happens is it decomposes really quickly and allows all that nutrients um, back into the ground right at the plant. So it's like a, a side dressing, but just chock full of goodness. And, and your comfrey, I'm assuming people could grow it in a container, but it's, it's best to be put in the ground and just leave it there for years and years. Yeah, because and that part of how it gets um, the potassium and the uh, nitrogen and, and uh, phosphorus is by this really deep root system, and that's one of the reasons people who do grow it, for some reason, um, if you're not if they're unaware of how to care for the plant, they let it go to flower, um, and then they try to get rid of it, and it's very hard because it has such a deep root system. People will like chop it and be like, it keeps coming back. <laughs> So um, as long as you continue, you can use the true comfrey as long as you chop it before um, it, uh, it goes to flower. You can be ruthless, cut all the way to the ground, use all of the plant, and it, you, know, you can use it in so many places. I never have excess. I'm always running out and needing to make more. And just as a little tip when handling it, um, some people get a rash from the leaves. I haven't, but some people do. So if you've never done it before, wear gloves the first time because it has like these little bristles on it. But um, it's just so it, there's just so many great ways to use it to make your garden better. I just can't say enough good things about it. I can tell you're definitely passionate about it, and and we really appreciate appreciate the information you've brought to us today. How can people find out more about you? 
Um, they can go to my website, kellyorzel.com, K-E-L-L-Y-O-R-Z-E-L.com. And they can also follow me on Instagram, and my handle is Bowery Beach Farm. And I'll be there, and I share kind of what's going on <laughs> in my gardens. Well, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered to Holly and myself and all of our listeners, not only educating us, but everyone uh, around. We thank you for that. Oh, thank you. And when we come back, it's going to be about your garden questions, our garden answers. You're listening to The Garden with Joy and Holly, radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Tired of dealing with bugs but don't want to use harmful chemicals to repel them? Naturally Green No More Bugs is all natural and plant-based. No more chemical bug repellent. Use it around your home and on you, indoors and out. DEET free and will not stain. Repels mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, flies, and more. No More Bugs is the answer to what is bugging you. Stop using harmful chemicals and use what is safe for you, your family, pets, and the environment. For more information, visit natgreenproducts.com. Natgreenproducts.com. Have essential oils always confused you like they did me? Take out some of the guesswork with Simply Earth. The Simply Earth Essential Oil Recipe Box will help you gain confidence and clarity in using essential oils to help make your home toxin-free. Here's how it works. You receive the recipe box with four pure essential oils, six recipe cards, and extras. Then you learn how to use your essential oils while making the recipes created by certified aromatherapists clear and concise step-by-step directions. Save money and detoxify your life. I got to make fun products that will detoxify my home while also learning safe ways to use my essential oils. The best part is these oils don't break my budget. Simply Earth's essential oils are 100% pure and come from the best farms from all over the world. Using essential oils to support your wellness doesn't have to be overwhelming. My home is one step closer to being toxin-free because I made the wax melts and more with the Simply Earth Essential Oil Recipe Box. Visit simplyearth.com to find your recipe box and more. Hello, I'm Joey Baird from the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. If you're looking for merchandise for the program, you can go to thatismyshirt.com and get shirts with our logos on it. If you'd want to go a different route, they have a lot of comical, logical, and witty sayings on shirts that you can wear that makes a statement. From Val Victorian from Common Sense University to I Heart Compost to Don't Be Just Average Today and a number of other great sayings. It all can be found at thatismyshirt.com. That is myshirt.com. Sizes from small to five, extra large, and multiple colors per shirt to choose from. That is myshirt.com. You move your lawn sprinklers all over the yard, but you always end up putting them in the same spots. Why not just bury them there? Out of sight, always ready to use, pre-adjusted to water the precise areas you want. Quick Snap Sprinklers makes it easy. In-ground sprinklers without the hassle or expense of laying pipe. Put the sprinklers anywhere in your lawn or garden. Snap on a hose to supply the water. Water on, it pops up. Water off, it drops below ground. You can mow right over it. You can have a buried sprinkler system up and running in just minutes. Each quick snap saves thousands of dollars. They install in minutes and operate for years. Visit quicksnapsprinkler.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Blue Ribbon Organics, Naturally Green Products, Ironwood Tool Company, Easy Step Products, Rinse Kit, Soul Brew Kabucha, Wild Delight, Rycon Vitova, Chip Drop, Bailbuster.com, Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Time for question and answer. You got a question, we have an answer for you. If you want to submit a question, you can do that at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. Holly, we had a number number of questions come in this week. Uh, Let's go with uh, just down the list, see what we can get through. Okay, so our first question is, how do I know 
the best way to tell when carrots are ready to harvest. I pulled one out. It's small. I don't want to keep doing that. What are some tips to figure that out? Uh, well, if the carrots are growing the way they should be growing, meaning most of the carrot body is under the ground, you want to just take and rake away some of the dirt on top of it, and then you can see what diameter your carrots are. Um, now, that doesn't mean that if your carrots are an inch and a half across, that they're going to be eight or nine inches long, um, like... Um, like you would uh, want them to be. So you want to keep that in mind. But if you have a good diameter, that's at least a good indication of uh, maybe a time to at least pull a couple of the larger diameter ones and see what you're looking at. They will typically grow 60 to 70 days is the length of time uh, to reach maturity and uh, go from there. Um, that, that's the best information I can provide for you. What else we got here? Um, I have seen people dig away from the bulbs of their onions in hopes that their onions will grow bigger. Is this necessary? Is there any truth to this action? Um, so it, there, there's simply not. Um, onion size is determined by the, the variety, essentially. And digging them... Okay, even if, say, you think you would get a bigger onion... Digging around them is not going to make a difference. The key would be to have nice, loomy uh, soil. That's going to help any root crop grow better when they have that option and availability to do so. So digging around the onions is not going to do anything, but it's up to the variety. Right. And, uh, and yeah, there's some onions that are going to be smaller and some varieties that are just going to be bigger. And it all determines on if you had a lot of water or not. If you didn't have a lot of water and the onion was stressed, it's not going to have a very large bulb. And if the soil was dense, it's not going to have a very large bulb. It's just not going to happen no matter how much soil you move around. So keep that in mind. Uh, let's see here. How can I save celery seeds? Sure. So celery is a bi biennial um, plant. Yes. And so what it does is it's going to put seeds up the second year. So if you want to save celery seeds, you just want to leave one of the plants there and the next year it'll come back with seeds. Yeah. Don't, uh, don't, you don't, you can trim, you can harvest some of the outer portions of the, the leaves or the, the stalks, but you want to leave that core intact and you don't have to dig it up you don't have to cover it just let it alone and then next spring that thing will pop back up out of the out of the cold depths of winter uh at the appropriate time and it will put on a lot of seeds for you to save and um, i think we we grow a utah uh celery and it doesn't need to be blanched uh, right. a couple of these varieties that uh are, can be grown in your backyard do not need to be blanched now, keep in mind, if you're growing celery in your backyard, it's not going to have the same structure as it would if you bought it from the uh, uh, grocery store. Different variety, different companies, different types of deals. It's um, It's got a nice flavor if you like celery. I don't like celery, but if you like celery, so that, yeah, it, does, it does have a nice flavor. It has flavor. a nice flavor, but I don't like it. Well, I'm just saying that it's, right. it's not as bland as store-bought. Um, so here's another question is my zucchini plants are in a container. I move them after two disastrous seasons and an ever increasingly shady garden. There are three plants. They get flowers and then sometimes a small zucchini comes along and then it just falls off. What's going on? Well, we've had that problem as well. Um, we have this problem persistently early on in the season and by late, late in the summer, we don't have the problem. Most of the time, if you're having this issue, it is because the it's not being pollinated correctly or you're not getting any pollination whatsoever. So you can hand pollinate when you see the male flowers come out and then the female flowers will come out. Um, that will, you can hand pollinate that way. A lot of people will uh, misdiagnose this condition as being a blossom in rot, such as you would get on tomatoes. However, this is not necessarily the case because we water and our plants are hydrated fully. This is a lack of pollination problem. So I, you know, keep, try to bring the pollinators in. Pollinators just do not have to be bees. They can be wasps. They can be ants. They can be butterflies. They can be a lot of birds. They can be a lot of different things. But if you're having this issue, self-pollination might be the key 
to doing such. Well, with that being said, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of the program today, or would you like to revisit? You can do that by going to our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and clicking on the Season 5 tab at the top of the page. Or if you'd want to make it easier, we can do that for you by you sending us an email to GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. And we'll send you a link to this program. Tune in next week. You will not want to miss this. We're going to go over things you can do with all that extra zucchini that's coming out of your garden. As well as garden products that we would not use in our garden. And we'll tell you why that is. And our guest will be author Jenny Romer. And we'll answer your garden questions. That's all next week. So until next week for Holly Baird. I'm Joy Baird. And we will see you in the garden.